I see these people walking on the on the on the treadmill and kicking their legs out and squeezing their glutes. Uh, I see them high, high knee highing on the uh, on the stepmaster. They look ridiculous. You, you're not going to spot reduced fat. Okay, it's just not going to happen. If you try to do it, you're wasting your time and just and just basically <laughs> you'll look like a lunatic in the gym. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. During strenuous lifting, is it beneficial to maintain a higher blood blood sugar level during your training? I know protein intake is important for recovery, but how would carbs play a role in recovery as a diabetic or even someone who is not? If your sugar drops during training, what is a sustainable carb to eat instead of gulping soda and candy? Yeah. Um, the good thing about the body is that there's something called counter-regulatory hormones. And... What those do is they, when your blood sugar gets too low, they raise blood sugar. And those are cortisol. Cortisol can turn amino acids into glucose and glucagon, which is also produced from the pancreas. And glucagon basically takes sugar that's stored in the liver and the muscles and it releases it into the bloodstream as free glucose. So those are always at work. The only reason why you would ever go super low while you're training would be because maybe you just took if you're taking insulin, maybe you took too much by accident, uh, or maybe you didn't eat enough carbs before your workout, or maybe you ate a lot of sugary carbs and you got a huge insulin surge in your body, which dropped your blood sugar too low, um, or you took maybe some of these glucose disposal agents. I remember once I took like vanadyl sulfate before I went to the gym, and man, did I get low blood sugar there. I, I thought I took, you would have thought I took like 20 units of a, of a fast acting insulin. That's how low my blood sugar went. So, I never did that again. So that's why I always wonder how stupid people are to take insulin before they go to the gym. Now, if you're a type one diabetic and you have to take insulin, you know, for, you know, because you produce none, that's a different story. But type one diabetics know how much to take. If they eat 20 grams of carbs, they take two units of Humalog. You know, if they eat 40 grams of carbs with a meal, they take, you know, four units of Humalog. So, you know, but for people who are like bodybuilders trying to supplement, don't, don't take your insulin before you go to the gym and you won't go low. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. Take it after the gym if you want, you know. Uh, and in that case, if you go a little low, you can, you can, you can just eat a little extra carbs and, and, and tighter it off and, and balance it off. But that's why I always tell people the long-acting insulins are really the safest because they work so slowly in the background that if you did go a little low, your body has plenty of time to release glucagon and raise blood sugar. And uh, so most people on long-acting insulins don't don't go low. You know, I take a long acting insulin at night, uh, once a day. I take a Trishiba or Tujeo, which are both thirty six hour insulins, and that's just to keep my my fasting blood sugars low. I don't I don't I don't like being on that borderline of like ninety two, ninety three, ninety four. You know, I don't I don't want to have to limit my my intake of carbs at night because I'm worried about waking up you know high. And most people, if you ask a doctor, they would say 94, 95 is not high. But 
I believe cumulatively over years and years and years, it is high. And, and if my body can't keep my blood sugars under 90 when I wake up in the morning, I'm, that to me is telling me that my pancreas is just not capable of producing large amounts of insulin. So I would rather take a long acting and supplement so that my body, now I'm waking up in the 80s. I'm waking up at 85 or 86 or 87 you know, blood sugars, which is exactly where I want my blood sugars. That's the safety zone under 90. You're not going to get cumulative side effects from that long term. And you know what? I don't have to worry now. If I want to have a bigger meal, my body has enough insulin on board because I'm supplementing what my body's naturally producing. And, you know, that's a personal decision on my part. You know, you don't have to do that. But I, I work with a lot of bodybuilders who eat a lot of food. And if you're eating eight times a day and you're eating, you know, 400 grams of carbs every day and you're eating, you know, 400 grams of protein every day, that's a lot of food that needs to be, you know, absorbed. And what do you think is doing the absorbing? It's insulin that's doing it. So, you know, if you already have sluggish insulin production or you're over the age of 35 and your insulin production might have dropped a little bit and you're taking growth hormone, which makes your insulin doesn't work as well, that's putting a tremendous burden on your pancreas. And if you're waking up with higher blood sugars, which a lot of guys are, I could probably say 50% of the people I work with uh, wake up with higher blood sugars. We put them on a long-acting insulin. It solves the problem. And no one goes low. I, I had one person who went low. And we couldn't figure out why he was going low every, every night. And then he realized he went to Walmart. He asked for a, a bottle of Novulin N. And they actually gave him the R, which is the fast acting. So he was taking faster acting before bed. Of course, he was waking up in the middle of the night going low. But that was a mistake, you know, that was made. But aside from that, no one goes low on, on long acting. Take a couple of more questions. A bit of a, I guess, anonymous, I don't want to say confession, but uh, admission. Uh, there is a team of uh, 20 women under a single coach, uh, four of which all have kidney failure, uh, stage three, or three in stage two, one in stage three. All 100% natural bodybuilders of various ages, mid 20s and mid 40s. Supplements are standard whey protein, mid range pre workouts, greens, and some other over the counter things like multivitamins, et cetera. Uh, what could be the possible cause for their kidney failure? You know, this, for me to speculate in that scenario, it would be I'd have to be the dumbest person of all time. It could be the water they're drinking, for all I know. You know, they might be poisoned. There's no, there's no rational rhyme or reason. You know, uh, do they all have high blood pressure? I mean, high blood pressure is the number one reason why people go into kidney failure. Um, you told me they're not on gear. You know, they're they're it's not like they're bikini competitors. They're not walking around at 300 pounds in the off season. So, I don't know. I have no idea. It, it, bad coincidence? I don't know. Like I said, I, I forget who who was I interviewing. He told me that. Uh, oh, Dennis Newman. I did an interview recently with on uh, Dennis James podcast and Dennis Newman was on there and we were, you know, we were talking about the fact that he, after he won the USA in, in 1995, he was diagnosed with leukemia, which he obviously had while he was actually pre prepping for the show. And he felt terrible. And I said, I wonder why you got leukemia. And he said, you know, years later, I found out that the place I was living uh, was on some kind of a built on some kind of a dump or something like that. And there was like some toxic chemicals in the ground. And a lot of people had gotten leukemia from that neighborhood. And which makes sense, you know, rather than blame, you know, growth hormone or, or his testosterone he took or his lifestyle, because he was still only 24 years old at the time or 26 years old. Um, he was poisoned, basically. And usually a lot of times when you see these weird, oh, these people all of a sudden are in kidney failure and they're young and they're, and they're healthy and they work out, it's usually something else that's causing it. So I wouldn't be shocked if something you know, it was tainted in the water supply or something they were taking, maybe a supplement was tainted or something like that. Who knows? Uh, like I said, it would be silly for me to speculate because I just, I just don't know the situation. Simple question, but I guess, uh, obviously a lot to go into this, how to get definition in legs. Is, is this from a woman, Sid? No. Oh. Uh, well, I don't think so. It looks like a dude. Oh. No, no, because sometimes women have a tough time getting their legs leaner and their upper bodies get lean real easily. And a lot of times it's because people don't take in enough essential fatty acids. Because in women, when you don't eat enough essential fats in your diet, you know, metabolically what happens is their bodies hoard fat because of estrogen production in their body in the lower body. Um, once you restore normal essential fatty acid um, 
levels to their body, whether it be through supplements, diet, or both, they start losing fat evenly from the upper and lower body. And I discovered this many years ago. And that's why 99% of the women that I work with are always on respectable amounts of fats in their diet, at least usually a, a gram per pound, excuse me, uh, usually a half a gram per pound that they weigh. So if they're, if they're 100 pounds, usually I'm getting, giving them at least 50 you know, grams of, of fat. Most of the women I work with are probably in the 150 range. So they're doing like 75 grams of fat per day. And they don't necessarily do it every single day of the week, but they're, they're getting a lot more fat than they were eating, which most people eat almost no fat in their diet. And that, that's a big mistake, especially if you're having trouble losing fat on the lower body. Now, if you're a man and you don't have high estrogen in your body, that shouldn't really be the case. But some people just hold their fat there. And you can't spot reduce fat. You know, I see these people walking on the, on the, on the treadmill and kicking their legs out and squeezing their glutes. Uh, I see them high, high knee highing on the uh, on the stepmaster. They look ridiculous. You, you're not going to spot reduced fat. Okay, it's just not going to happen. If you try to do it, you're wasting your time and just and just basically <laughs> you look like a lunatic in the gym. Uh, you have to just diet it off. Cardio obviously is important, but you're not going to spot. It's going to when you do cardio, you're burning fat evenly throughout your whole body. Same thing with diet. When you're dieting and and your body's losing fat. You don't lose it from one area over another. You lose it evenly over your entire body. It's just that the places that hold the most fat in your body take the longest to lose it. Because let's face it, if you're losing an eighth of an inch of fat every week from your body, you know the places that don't have as much fat will get lean, and and you'll say, oh shoot, I got crazy ripped abs, but my my glutes are still soft. Oh, because you had an extra twenty pounds of fat on, on your butt. It's going to take longer to get that off, and that's just a time you know time thing. So. I mean, you can use fat burners, obviously, like clenbuterol and T3. You know, there are natural fat burners like my lipolyzed fat burner. There are, you know, people do cardio. They restrict carbs. You know, obviously, carb restriction works well, for, especially for women with lower body fat, too. But it's a combination of everything, and you have to just be patient. Everyone has different, you know, trouble areas. A lot of guys have trouble areas on their lower back and their abs, and that's the last to come in. Some people, it's glutes and hamstrings. Some women, it's it's thighs. You know, and it just it depends on the person, and you have to be patient. That's why it's terrible to look in the mirror and, and hit a front double by and say, "Wow, I'm in shape." Well, yeah, from the front you are, but not from the back, not from the back. You still have work to do. So that's why it's also important to have someone around, whether it be a coach or another person who can, you know, legitimately tell you, "Hey, you're ready or you're not ready." Your opinion on uh, Milos's body recomposition, uh, I guess to explain it, take carbs pre, intra, post, uh, and the other meals, protein and fat is logical because the most demanding moment of the day to take carbs is around the training. I mean, uh, everything works if you do it religiously and, and you apply it. The problem is, I, I find, is that when people diet, let's say you're eating, obviously, if in Milos's approach, you're eating carbs on his diet. So let's say that we're, we're going to be giving someone carbs how many grams is obviously depends on how big the person is. If they're 300 pounds, they're going to be eating a lot more than the person who's 200 pounds. But I like to spread them out through most of the day. The only time I don't give carbs usually is before bed. Because I feel like if, if you're eating carbs, you know, your brain is using carbs as a fuel source. If you're not eating it, you know, at certain parts of the day and then other parts you are eating it, you're only going to feel good when you're actually eating the carbs on, on the parts of the day where you're not eating carbs. Your brain is not going to switch into ketosis. It takes three days of carb restriction to do that. You're only restricting carbs half the day. The part of the day where you're not eating carbs, you're going to feel terrible. You know, you're going to feel irritable. You're going to feel kind of goofy in the brain because your brain has no fuel source. So I don't see the advantage of that. In other words, if you're going to eat, you know, 150 grams of carbs for the day, let's say that's your, your carb requirement or that's what your coach is telling you to eat. Why not eat 30 grams five times a day? And then the last meal, the sixth meal, just, just don't have any it spreads it out better. You have a much better blood sugar level. You feel better. Um, your body's going to still store glycogen the same way it would as if you slam it into three meals a day uh, or two meals a day. So I, I just don't, I don't understand the, the benefit of doing that. Now, Milos does have another, a different protocol off season wise where he, he, he slams a lot of carbs in pre intra and post workout because he does an insulin protocol with that. That's a different story that, that I understand why he's doing that, but I don't. I wouldn't understand why, while dieting for a competition, why you would restrict carbs 
at some meals but not other it doesn't it doesn't make sense unless your carb intake is so low that you just don't have enough to spread around you don't want to eat 10 grams of carbs you know all day you know at five meals that, because you're only eating 50 grams of carbs a day if you're eating 50 grams of carbs a day i can understand 25 and 25 at, at two of your meals but not if you're eating 100 150 grams better off spreading it out that's just my my philosophy